Today's reading is from Psalm 85. You, Lord, showed favour to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, God our Saviour, and put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Well, have you seen them yet? And I wonder what your favorite one is. Is it the Irish one with the boy who is all the way asking through, is he coming, is he coming? And we discover it's not really who we thought it was going to be, but his granddad. Or do you prefer the one that's a trip down memory lane around dad's gravy and hoping that on the special day you get to taste it together? What about the one that encourages acts of kindness? Or perhaps the one produced in conjunction with fair share, highlighting the needs of those who are struggling. Well, have you worked out what I'm talking about? It's this year's 2020 Christmas adverts. And as we head towards Christmas and into Advent in a couple of weeks' time, we are specifically beginning this series looking at revival. And today I've been tasked with helping us to look at personal revival through the scripture we're going to use that Emma read to us in Psalm 85. And as we go through the psalm, I'm going to do two things. Firstly, I'm going to relate it to revival. And secondly, I'm going to relate it to our present day and the era in which we find ourselves, which we know is already a significant time in world history and in the life of the church. So as always, let's begin with scripture, shall we? Psalm 42 and 40, sorry, sorry, Psalm 43 and 44 and Psalm 84 and 85 are similar in the way that they are pairs that parallel each other in style. So Psalm 84, the one before the one we had read today, is a procession psalm, a song of the people of God as they set out on pilgrimage to Jerusalem for one of the festivals, probably the festivals of tabernacles. The people of God loved to worship in Jerusalem because that was the place of the temple where the presence of God resided. So now in Psalm 85, the pair of the couple, this is the song when they arrive. So right at the start, I want us to ask this question. What is our pilgrimage? What is our pilgrimage? You see, Jesus has made it possible for us to enter the presence of God wherever we are. So for us, pilgrimage is not to a physical place, but rather seeking the face of God is his presence. And the nature of Psalm 44 and 85 are that as the people approach the temple to worship, surprisingly, it's one of lament or complaint. And the reason for that will become obvious in a minute or two. Well, in this psalm, Psalm 85, if if you're able to pull it up on your phone, but don't get distracted by text or other things, or even better, if you've got a, a, a paper copy with you, you might find it helpful to open it up. Because there are three parts to this psalm. Part one is verses one to three which recalls what God has done for his people in the past. Very much like the song of revival we sang a minute ago, the recalling of what God has done in the past. Things that they couldn't don't have done for themselves, things that they didn't deserve. And that feeds into part two, as they now recognize all isn't well. 
So part two, verses four to seven, is seeking God's favor and renewal, recognizing the need of that once more. And then the psalm concludes with part three, verses eight to 13, where it looks ahead with great confidence. And and genuinely, I really love that song revival because for me, it echoes, it's, it's like a modern day psalm on this subject. So part three, verses one to three, what has God done? We read, you, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. Well, it's past history that is being referred to here. When the nation had been brought back from exile in Babylon, or it may be referring to Israel's history around the Exodus, the time of Moses. In a way, it doesn't matter because it's the past history they're referring to. The key is the significance of the word which we translate as restore. And that links to the request then that we see in verses 4 and 6, revivers again. This restoration involved God's favor upon his people and the land. And the restoration involved forgiveness, the covering of sins, which shows us God's merciful character and the setting aside of God's wrath, his hot, red anger, revealing the character of justice. It says, you forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. This describes the Lord's actions in the past, demonstrate the current situation the people are in, as I've said. And now again, they are needing God's mercy and his forgiveness. Because the people have once again turned away from him. And in our pilgrimage today, isn't that true of us as a nation? And does it matter that we've turned away from God? Well, yes, yes, it really, really, really matters. Because this is an issue of salvation. It's an issue of division from our creator from our living Heavenly Father. And yes, it matters because when people turn away from God, society and culture is deeply affected. And there is division to a turning away from creation itself, from other people, so that we live selfishly. We battle with the earth, but not just physically, we battle spiritually too. And so I take from all of that A great challenge in the prayer that we now read in this psalm. It's a magnificent prayer. Let me remind us of this again. Restore us again, God our Saviour, and put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love and grant us your salvation. We're asking the Lord to restore, forgive, revive, love, and bring salvation. And when we think back to this year's Christmas adverts that I've described earlier, they reveal our desire as human beings, don't they? Our desire for restored relationships. That's clear in the first example I gave gave of the, the grandson wanting to be restored in relationship with his grandfather. Those adverts are trying to address the notion that Christmas is cancelled. And by the way, it's not cancelled because you can't cancel the birth of Jesus. They're seeking in their adverts to revive lost sales, income, traditions, jobs. They are making statements about love. Now, I know I'm on dangerous ground here talking about this because I feel a bit Christmas, as, Christmas out already. But I also know that some of you really, really love Christmas. I do too, but I, I want to stress I'm not knocking anybody who's saying anything about Christmas out there, especially if you're talking about putting up your tree and so on. Uh, I'm really not. But in the broadest sense, these adverts reference that I reference already reveal the truth that our society has taken Christ out of Christmas and because we've taken as Christians so often Christ out of our lives in the everyday and really seeking him many 
have never even been introduced to Jesus. The stats of the amount of people who go to church in this land that was once very Christian is so appalling. Less than 90% of the people follow Jesus. So the Irish and the Sainsbury's advert convey the need for restored relationship. But for us, it's important we understand that is the restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. And the John Lewis and the McDonald's advert convey the need for a restored society. And the two go hand in hand when we're talking about revival. So this prayer in the middle of Psalm 85 is the one that we need to pray globally, nationally, as a city, as a church and individually. But note here there is a corporate emphasis. This prayer has the word us six times. Because the church is the body of Christ and we are the temple, we are the family of God, we are the bride. It is we, 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 every step of the way, the people of God. And we see it expressed, don't we, in, in many different forms and in many different sizes. So in worship gatherings such as we have, you in your home, me here, but also when we're corporately here as a church. Half nights of prayer in our Monday evening Zoom prayer. Our times of thirst when we get back all together. Within our missional communities, our prayer triplets and our pairs. Nationally, there's other stuff too. We've seen the Archbishop of Canterbury's call to prayer at 6 p.m. each evening. And there are endless 24-7 prayer times across the world and many, many forms of prayer houses across the world. We see it. But today's theme is about personal revival. And so far, I've talked about us. And I think this is where the rubber hits the road for us as a church. You see, we seem to either rely on others to do the praying and we'll opt in when it's convenient. Or we focus on praying on our own. And, um, sorry, pray and focus on our own, but only with others according to our preference. Do you see that? Let me remind us. Relying on praying, others to do the praying and we opt in. Or we pray on our own and only join with others according to our preference. So when the psalm suddenly makes this reference... To the single, I will listen. It's not just for the individual benefit of the person praying it. It's for the land, the people of God, that his glory may dwell in our land. And boy, we really want the blessings of restoration and revival, don't we? They're summarized in verses 10 to 13. Love and faithfulness, righteousness and peace, favor and harvest for the land. But we don't get to set the time when revival comes or how it comes because that's the Lord's job. When revival comes, he will be dealing with specific sin and brokenness in our individual lives, but also for us as a society and us and our land. Well, earlier in the summer, we had a podcast revival series, and I hope that's coming back to your mind. And I strongly recommend that you go and listen to them. You can access them on our website under the resources, and you can listen to them. It won't take you long. I've been listening to them in preparation for this sermon. I want to encourage you to get to know the story so that we understand what we're talking about when we talk about revival, because revival is often a banded word. Know the stories. And in each story, you will see that there is either an individual or a small group of people who encounter the Lord powerfully. And that the only condition is a seeking heart. Men, women, children encounter the Lord. People of different ethnicities around the world. People from all backgrounds, educated and non-educated. No one is excluded the Lord chooses whom he will choose. And we see in these stories how the Lord is calling his people to gather together for prayer so often in small groups and that praying on one's own is key. When that happens, division is dealt with as people are convicted of disunity and brought to repentance. 
And sometimes that needs to happen in order to make the way for the revival to actually come as a result. And I believe repentance for the divisions in the church and in society needs to precede a revival and the outpouring of God's power in our land, such as in the story of the Moravian, East African, and Ponoigan revivals. There's much that we have to repent of. Deliberate division and unknown division. As with the Black Forest Revival, also known as the Awakening, I believe we need to deal with the devil's strongholds in the spiritual realm over us, many of which we have allowed to happen. When Jit spoke on that, he quoted Martin Lloyd-Jones, who says, When the darkness and the evil has gone too deep into the land, only revival will deal with it. We need revival. Only breakthrough revival can deal with the darkness that seeps deep into the land. It can't be got rid of in any other way. And I believe this applies to us. In the Mukti revival, a Hindu dominant country in India, obviously, we see that no land is beyond reaching. There is no ground that is too hard for revival to break through. And I think that's really important for us to note on this Diwali weekend. In these revivals, we see the stories of blessings, of signs and wonders and miracles, such as in the Azusa revival, and many who were saved as in the Chinese revival, the evangelical and Welsh revivals. And we can be sure that when revival comes, we will see the same because of the prophetic words the Lord has given us. But that means we therefore need to seek the face of God. We need to seek his revival, his restoration. Well, I've mentioned nine out of the ten revivals mentioned in our podcast series, which leaves the Hebridean revival when the Lord told the people to fling wide the gates in the same way that he has told us. It was the discipleship of just two faithful women in prayer that was the seed of that revival. The vision of fling wide the gates for us is about discipleship, walking as Jesus did. And the outcome of revival is a changed society in terms of social justice because the people of God are called and convicted to holiness. So what then is our part in the individual seeking of God for revival? And I want to tell you there is no one format as those stories would tell you. There's no one method. But there are four things we find in these verses 8 to 9. I will listen to what the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. But let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in the land. So the four things. Firstly, I will listen. Now I'm standing at a pulpit and I chose specifically to stand at the pulpit to preach from today. To illustrate that I will listen means actually stepping away from our pulpits. Leaving our pulpits behind. And submitting to the Lord that we would listen. We've lost the art of listening. Secondly, the word we see there is faithful, and that's obediently following Jesus 24-7. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Thirdly, it says, no turning to folly. That means there can be no other God. Not money, not Christmas, not comfort, not football, no other day deity only Jesus and then the fourth is to fear the Lord it says your glory hovers over all who bow before you in humility so part of our listening moving away from our pulpit is literally to step down and to come and change our posture and literally bow before the Lord in submission in humility I will listen I will be faithful. I will not turn away. I will fear the Lord. 
we must fear the Lord. We must seek his face. We must hunger after him for a fresh anointing in our land. John Piper wrote this. He said, the cost of the food in the kingdom is the hunger for the bread of heaven instead of the white bread of the world. Now, I've told you I'm not knocking Christmas. But the problem is we're all about Christmas at the minute and we're missing Advent. And we're starting Advent today in seeking revival because Advent is about the expectation, the seeking, the crying out, come Lord Jesus, come, come Lord Jesus, come. So the us of this psalm is made up of the singular you and me. So for yourself, let me remind you of a well-known story that the well-known preacher of Gypsy Smith so-called because he was born in a gypsy tent. He was born in the Epping Forest outside London in 1860, and he crisscrossed the Atlantic Ocean some 45 times, preaching with great enthusiasm to thousands of people. But we read that more powerful than his preaching was his prayer, his private prayer. There was a delegate who was uh, part of a revival-seeking group who asked him his secret, and Gypsy Smith responded, Go home, lock yourself in your room, kneel down in the middle of your floor, and with a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself. There on your knees, pray fervently and brokenly that God would start a revival within that chalk circle. I know we're in lockdown. What an opportunity to choose that wisely, to seek God. So find a piece of chalk or a piece of string. Go into the secret place, into the hiding place. Start Advent this day and seek the Lord for revival. Amen.